Uh, today we're preaching on the sovereignty of God. And uh, I'm going to ask you to open your Bible to Psalm 115, verse 3. And uh, today's uh, message, today's sermon will be a series of uh, verses that we're going to look at. And we're going to look at this theme that just is kind of woven throughout the entire Bible. And uh, it's something that I think is highly important to us, especially in Brownsville, where we have over 140 churches, where many, many of those churches are not preaching a full gospel, uh, a biblical gospel of God being the one who pursues us. You know, we don't pursue God. None of us woke up one day and said, I'm going to go to church. That was God working in us to take us there. So I want to touch on this very important uh, topic on the sovereignty of God. And let's read all together with a nice loud voice. There where you are, Psalm 115, verse 3. And this is what it says. Our God is in heaven, and He does whatever He pleases. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Father, I thank You for Your Word. I thank You for uh, speaking to us directly. I thank You, God, because You are sovereign, because You are subject to no one and nothing. And because You do what You please, Lord, uh, we want to fully understand what that means for us. Lord, please uh, help us to focus on You today. Help us to remove from our mind any distraction. And I pray, God, that uh, after we leave here today, Lord, we would fully grasp, or at least to a certain degree, what it means that you are sovereign. We ask you all of this in Jesus' good name. Amen. So quick definition so you know what sovereignty means. Sovereignty is this. It means supreme and absolute power and authority. Okay? Someone who is sovereign has no one above them. They are the ultimate power and authority. So if you were to go to a place like Saudi Arabia, where they still have monarchy-type government, the king of Saudi Arabia... He's the sovereign, so to speak, of his country. He's the highest. There's no one above him in his country. And the reason we need to talk about this is because there's a lot of misunderstandings of what sovereignty is. And because there has been a bad understanding of this, there's been all kinds of uh, false theology, all kinds of false teaching. And in a more practical sense, we have a false view of God because we don't understand his sovereignty. And let me share with you some of the attributes of God. Number one, He is holy. That means He's set apart. There's no one like Him. He is omnipresent. He's everywhere all at once. Number two, he, number three, He's omnipotent. He can do anything and there's nothing impossible with God. He's omniscient. He knows everything. I was, in a, I was supposed to preach a sermon today called Nothing to Hide from the Timothy series. Um, and part of that had to do with the fact that there's nothing we can hide from God. He knows everything. He's also self-sustaining. He needs nothing. He doesn't need you and me. Uh, contrary to what some people would have you know and understand, and I'll share some of the quotes today, God doesn't need us. He's self-sustaining. He is eternal, which means He never dies. He is immortal. That means God's life is forever. And lastly on this, He's perfect. There's no other perfect thing in the world except His Word, which is perfectly preserved, no mistakes in it, and God has revealed that to us Himself. He is perfect. Okay? All of these things are things that we are not. So we can't really comprehend. Um, I'll give you a, it's kind of a bad example. You, we breathe in oxygen. We breathe out what? Carbon dioxide. And that's our nature. That's all we know how to do. If I were to tell you, go breathe underwater, you would say, no thanks. I don't know how to do that. Because we are not... Uh, People that live underwater, we don't know how to breathe underwater because we're not perfect, omnipresent, omniscient. We don't know what these things are. It's only because God has revealed them to them, to us. And there is no attribute of God that is more misunderstood than His sovereignty. So let's look at it. There's two ways you can get this wrong. Number one, you can have a fatalistic view of God's sovereignty. And this is the view that I had when I first became a Christian. The view of something called hyper-Calvinism or something in philosophy called determinism, which is this. Everything that's going to happen has already been determined, so why bother doing anything? Okay? My friends who are hyper-Calvinists, they say this, God already knows who's going to get saved. We don't need to be out preaching on the streets. He's already going to save them. And at the same time, God has commanded us, go into all the world, preach the gospel. This is something else that they say. Since God already ordained everything, God must be the creator of evil. Have you ever asked yourself that? If God made everything... He made the devil. Did God create evil? And so this fatalistic view of God is sovereign leads you to believing that He cannot be trusted, 
Yeah, he might be powerful, but I don't think I trust him because he lets bad things happen. I had a conversation this week with a man and uh, sharing the gospel with him, pleading with him, come to Jesus, come to Jesus. One of his objections was this, well, why does God let bad things happen? He's not the first person to ask that. He's not going to be the last. And uh, one of the examples he gave was, I saw a story of, you know, a child being abused with, at home. Why didn't God kill the man in that instant when he was about to commit the act? Why didn't he give him what he deserved? And I said, that's a good question. I don't have truly an answer to that. But here it is. What about you? Let's talk to you. I know some things that you've done that have harmed other people in very bad ways. Why didn't God kill you as you were about to do them? No, no, that's not fair. I'm not a bad person. You see, we compare ourselves to other people. This fatalistic view leads you to think, well, I don't think I can trust God. Some people also think this. It wasn't Judas's fault that he betrayed God. God had programmed him to betray him. It wasn't Satan's fault that he fell. God, since he's sovereign, he ordained Satan to become a fallen angel, to become the devil, to do all these bad things. They were just programmed to do what they do. That's a fatalistic view, and that's the wrong view to see God's sovereignty. Number two, something that I want to call limited sovereignty. And this is the other extreme. Some people say that He's sovereign, but not really. So they'll say things like this, Our faith activates God's power. Have you ever heard that before? God's power is there, we just have to activate it with our words or with our faith. They'll also say things like this, We chose God. We can command the Holy Spirit to do what we will. So when we pray, come down, Holy Spirit, what we're saying is, I command you to come down. And that's a low sovereignty view of God. That's not who God is. Let me give you some more popular examples. Uh, let's go to the first one there. Joel Osteen, he said this in one of his books. God has done everything he's already going to do. The ball is in your court. In other words, he's saying, there's nothing else that God is doing. Now it's all up to you. And imagine if you live like that thinking that God is not really in control in your life at all. It's just whatever I decide to do. You're going to make a lot of bad choices. And you're going to feel this weight crushing you that you can't handle. Let me share a verse with you that these guys use out of context. Matthew 13, 58. And that's what it says. And he, Jesus, did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. There's a part in the Bible where Jesus is going from town to town. He goes to his own hometown, Nazareth, and he's preaching. They don't believe in him. And he says, it's true. A prophet is only rejected in his own hometown. And the Bible says there, so Jesus did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. There's a popular pastor, you might know him, uh, Larry Furtick. His name is not Stephen Furtick, his name is Larry Furtick. Larry Furtick says this, Jesus could not do miracles. His power was trapped in their unbelief. Because there's one thing even the Son of God can't do. He can't override your unbelief. That is a low view of God. My friends, God can override your unbelief. That's the only reason you're saved today. You were not believing. He had to override your unbelief. And then He saved you. But guys like Larry Furtick, they preach this, this low view of the sovereignty of God, that you have the power over God. Oprah Winfrey, she says this, what kind of a God wants you to be broke and sick? In other words, we're supposed to be the ones commanding God to give us everything. Health, wealth, prosperity. And when you don't see that, that's why Oprah came to this conclusion. What kind of God would want you to be broke and sick? You see, it's not a real God. It's a low view of God. And lastly on this, one of the most disgusting views I saw of this is a guy named Ken Copeland. And he said this, God himself put mankind in charge. He doesn't intervene in the affairs of earth whenever He wants. He respects the dominion and authority He has given us. So, until man's lease on the planet expires, God restricts His power on the earth, taking action only when He is asked to do so. And this is saying God doesn't do anything unless we ask Him to do anything. This is a low view of God. And what are the results of this? You'll end up believing, number one, that God is good, but He's unable to do anything. You believe that God is good. He just doesn't have the power to stop things. Or, number two, you'll be able to believe this, that God is not able to do anything. Therefore, He must not be all that powerful. Some of you might think like this. Maybe God wants to, but He just really can't stop the suffering. Number three, you might believe that God is evil. 
and that people are not to blame for their actions. This is the view of the atheist or the agnostic. We're not bad people. Actually, God's bad. Why did he even allow for there to be a tree in the garden that would cause us to fall? So I wanted to build this case, but let's look at what the Bible has to say about God's sovereignty. We might be finished fairly quickly today, but I want to take my time on some of these verses. So here's the first one. The Bible says that God planned everything from beginning to end. Isaiah 46, 9 through 10, if you want to write some of these down so you can look them up later, I highly recommend it. It says this, remember what happened long ago. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and no one is like me. I declare the end from the beginning and from long ago what is not yet done. Saying this, my plan will take place and I will do all my will. God makes it clear through the prophet Isaiah. He says, I have determined what the beginning will be. I have determined what the end will be. I'm God, there is no other. And you see, some of the ways we twist this or the culture twists this is by saying things like, I can manifest a better life. I can proclaim a better life for myself just by speaking it, by declaring it, by claiming it. It's mine. And you see, God says, I am God. There is no other. He decides what's going to happen. From long ago, he declares what is not yet done, saying my plan will take place. When Donald Trump became president, God already knew that was going to happen. When Joe Biden won the presidency and some say he stole it and whatever, God already planned that. When Adolf Hitler slaughtered millions of people, God already knew that. It was not a surprise to him. Some people say this, God looked down the corridor of time and he said, oh, that person's going to choose me, so I'm going to go save him. God never learns anything. He already knows everything. He declares the beginning from the end. And how is that comforting? Because you, you and I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You and I have no idea if we'll even make it through the night. I don't have the statistic on this, but countless people die in their sleep. Some people say that, right? I want to go in my sleep. I'd rather just die and not wake up and... That's the way I want to go. Number two, what does the Bible say about God's sovereignty? He overrides evil for his purposes. Genesis 50 says this, and just to give you some context, this is the story of Joseph. You know who Joseph is. He was sold by his brothers into slavery. He was taken captive into Egypt. He was put in jail. God rescued him from there. He started working for a man named Potiphar. He's sent to jail again on false charges. God takes him out. He becomes the second in command to the king of Egypt. And now his brothers come to see him because they're looking for money, for food. And this is what Joseph says. He says, the Bible says, his brothers also came to him. They bowed down before him and they said, we are your slaves. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You planned evil against me. But here it is. God planned it for good to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. God can override evil. He can use evil for good. Look at yourself. What are some evil things that have happened in your life that God has turned them out for good? Perhaps God took you out of this to bring you where He needed you to be. God protected you from some people so that you could be with the right people. God protected you from some false teaching so that you could come to a church where we go through books of the Bible. God took some things that were evil and he uses them for good because God is sovereign. He overrides it. Number three, he appoints rulers and he reveals mysteries to us. Daniel 2, who is Daniel? A prophet in the Old Testament. He was taken captive as a slave from his hometown and he was taken to Babylon. There they had him castrated, if you know what that is, gentlemen, mutilated in his body so that he would serve the king. And there, he was taken also as someone who interpreted dreams for the king. And look what he says about his God amongst all the false gods. He changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals the deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. In America, we're living in a pretty dark season and it really feels like there's no way out. Now there's an Omicron variant of the COVID virus. 
We had the regular one. We had the Delta, now the Omicron. You're like, what is going on? It sounds like a sci-fi movie. It sounds fake. Like, this is not real. What's going on? And besides all that, political turmoil. You have the government taking, taking more, taking more of your freedoms without you really realizing it, giving you little checks to keep you happy. I'm not one for conspiracy theories. I don't wear a tinfoil hat. But the Bible declares that this is going to happen. It's going to happen. He knows the end from the beginning. The sexual revolution in America started in the 60s, 70s as an experiment. Let's see how far we can get away with sexualizing people, younger and younger ages. Let's see how far we can get. Where there's even like activists now who are, they don't call it pedophilia, they call, they call it MAP, M-A-P, Minor Attractive Persons. And they're saying we shouldn't judge them, we should try to understand them. You see, our society is not getting better, we're not evolving, we're devolving. We're going backwards. You know, when you see the monkeys, we're going that way, not this way. And don't let them tell you otherwise, we're not getting better. But here's the thing, because God is sovereign, He changes the times and the seasons. He has allowed you to be born in this season. He changes the kings and establishes kings. He's not surprised when a ruler is assassinated. He's not surprised when uh, a really, really bad person takes office. He appoints them. You're like, well, how is that a good God? In God's infinite purposes, sometimes He will appoint a bad king to punish a nation. He will appoint a bad ruler as judgment on that country. It was Billy Graham who said this, that if God does not punish America within the next hundred years, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Our sin as a nation has been so great where we redefine marriage, redefine family, redefine what a life is so now we can abort babies left and right, redefine what religion is so it's not just what you believe, it's what you tolerate. And by tolerance, I don't just mean you let me live my life. No, you have to agree with what I say. We're just adding as a nation sin and sin. So God has appointed bad rulers as a punishment. But here's the thing. As Christians, we're protected. God always keeps His people protected. And this doesn't mean you won't experience poverty. It doesn't mean you won't experience suffering. You will. But here's the thing. You'll, he'll bring you through it. And if we live for Christ, praise God. If we die for Christ, we'll see Him. So he appoints rulers and reveals mysteries to us. I know we had to pause the Revelation series for a while. And um, speaking to some of you, I'm like, okay, um, maybe we can take that up sometime in the future or do it as a Bible study. But then I had some other people, hey, when are we going to restart that, Pastor Manny? I, I really enjoyed learning Revelation. Who is the Antichrist? What is the mark of the beast, etc.? He reveals that to you. He, it says there, has light dwelling within him. In other words, there is no sin in God. There's no dark side of God. And that's kind of one of the false teachings, the duality of humans, that we are good and evil, so God must be good and evil. God is only good all the time. There's no shadow within Him. And what else does the Bible talk about His sovereignty? Number four, that He appointed His Son to die and rise for our sins. Let me tell you this. If you're one of the people that argues that, hey, God must not be that powerful because there's suffering out in the world. Why doesn't He stop it? Let me tell you this. He had the full power to stop the suffering of His Son Jesus, and He didn't. That should tell us something about suffering. Look at what it says in Isaiah 53. I would encourage you to find this in your own Bible. Highlight it. Circle it. This chapter, we're blessed as Christians to have it in our Bible. The Jewish people don't have this chapter in their Old Testament books. It's eliminated. It's erased. Because if they were to read it, they would see, wow, that's Jesus that it's talking about. Isaiah 53, verses 7 through 10. The Bible tells us that in His infinite wisdom and sovereignty, He appointed His Son to die and rise for our sins. And this is what it says about Jesus hundreds of years before He even came into the earth. It says, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet He did not open His mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before its shears, he did not open his mouth. That was Jesus. When he was arrested, he didn't fight back. He didn't call down an army of angels to destroy his enemies. He remained silent. Verse 8. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment. 
Who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. So the Son of Man, the Son of God, entered into human history because God the Father ordained it. And we know this because Jesus constantly said, that's the reason why I'm here, so that I can die and that I can rise from the dead. He was cut off because of my people's rebellion. Verse 9, he was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was with a rich man at his death because he had done no violence and he had not spoken deceitfully. That came true. Jesus was crucified between two criminals. And when he was buried, he didn't have money for a tomb. His family didn't. So a rich man gave him his tomb as a gift. Verse 10. Yet, here it is, the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. God the Father was not surprised that they killed Jesus. And he was not shocked. Oh my goodness, what's happening? That's not what I meant for my son to do down there. It says he was pleased to crush him. God was happy that Jesus was dying. God the Father was happy that the second member of the Trinity, God the Son, was dying. And what does it say in verse 10? When you make him a guilt offering, he will see his seed. He will prolong his days, and by his own hand, the Lord's ple pleasure will be accomplished. In other words, Jesus would die to you take your punishment and mine. He would be buried, and it says there, then he will see his seed. What does that mean? He will see his descendants. How can he if he's dead? That means he's going to rise. And you and I are that seed, are that fruit given from the seed. We're the ones that we come after him, his descendants by faith. We're part of that lineage, that family. When you see in the Old Testament, Abraham, when you see Isaac, Jacob, when you see King David, when you see King Solomon, when you see Rahab who found repentance and faith, when you see Naomi, when you see Ruth, all these Bible characters. Your name was added to that family tree, so to speak. You come from their faith as well. They passed it down to the next person, passed it down to the next person. And God wants you to do the same. Take your faith, pass it on to the next person. So in His sovereignty, He appointed His Son to die and rise for our sins. He decided that. We didn't ask for it. If we would have been present, some of us say, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have cried, crucify him, crucify him. But here's the reality. My friend, you and I would be there screaming at the top of our lungs, crucify him, crucify him. So what hope can we have in the fact that he is sovereign, that no one tells God what to do, no one needs to inform him of anything? Well, I want you to open your Bible with me to Romans 8. And we're going to spend the rest of our time there. Romans 8, 28 through 39. Here's a hope that we can have in the fact that He's sovereign. Because if you have, like the Muslims do, they have a God that they don't know if that God is loving or not. They have Allah, who they try to please, but they're not guaranteed salvation. At the end, Allah could decide to send them to hell. Here's the difference between our God. Our God is loving. Our God, we can trust Him. And our God is real. He's the only God. Big difference. So here's a hope that we can have. Number one, that He works out all things for our good. Let's go to Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28, there in our Bible, and this is what it says, We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, for those who are called according to His purpose. Some people take this verse who are not Christians and they apply it to themselves. They say, well, you see, everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be just fine. But look at the caveat. Look at the little uh, statement there that he says. He says, for the good of those who love God. If you love God, this is a promise for you. If you don't love God, this is not a promise that applies to you. You're not guaranteed anything. He says, all things work together for the good of those who love God. Those who have been diagnosed with cancer and who love Jesus. Those who have lost a child and love Jesus. Those who have lost a family member and love Jesus. Those who have been fired wrongfully and they love Jesus. It says all of that, God is working it out for the good of that person. It's a promise. Will we know the answers to why? No, we're not guaranteed the answer to why. 
And when we pray, we shouldn't pray, God, why did this happen? We should pray, God, what can I learn from this? You see, for some of you, this was a very hard year. For some of you, your marriage barely scraped by. For some of you, you're barely passing, you're barely keeping that GPA. For some of you, you're barely keeping your mental health together. All of this, God is using it for the good of those who love Him. And I ask you this question, do you love Jesus? Are you loved by Jesus? Has He shown you His mercy this year in a way that you can't explain, you can't comprehend? And if you were to try to put it into words, you run out of words. He's worked it out for your good because He loves you. You are beloved by Him. Number two, the hope we can have in the same little passage there, that He has chosen you for eternal life. Romans 8, 29 through 30. It says this, For those He foreknew, in other words, those that He knew before He created them. You see, God knew you before He made you. Those that He foreknew, He also predestined. And I'm going to pause in that word right there, circle it. This is where a lot of people get into theological fights and arguments. What do you mean predestined? Does that mean that God said, yes, go to heaven. Yes, you're, you're made to go to hell. You're made to go to heaven. You, no matter how hard you try, you're going to go to hell. You, no matter how hard you try, you're going to go to heaven. Is that what that means? People have argued for hundreds of years. Calvinism, Arminianism, all these isms. Here's the bottom line of this. We didn't choose God. He chose us. If we belong to Him, we, He won't let us fall. He won't let us walk away from Him. He'll keep us. Number three, you didn't do anything to deserve it. He chose to love you. And here's the bottom line on this. We were all on our way to hell. But in His mercy, He says, I'm going to save some of these. All of them already should go to hell. But in my mercy, I'm going to choose some of these to show my mercy on. And there's some passages elsewhere. We don't have time to read them, but he says this. God is the potter. We are the clay. He's just spinning us. He's deciding what to make us into. And he says, how dare the clay complain to the potter? Why are you making me this way? And this is where we come into the argument of do we have really free will or are we determined? Let me ask you this. Do you have free will right now? Yeah. Some of you choose to be here. Some of you chose to take a shower this morning. Some of you chose not to. How many of you showered, did not shower this morning? Don't raise your hand. We don't want to, we don't want to know. <laughs> and we don't want to smell. <laughs> you see, we have free will, but God is sovereign. And I don't want to defend that or put that together. I don't need to. God has revealed it that way. There's some things that we can just accept as truth. The fact that Jesus is God, He is man. Can I explain that? No. It is. The fact that when we die, our body goes to the ground, our soul goes to be with Jesus if we belong to Him, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how to explain that. I went to public school. I went to Porter. We didn't learn much there. You see, there's some things that we can't explain, like predestination, but we're called to accept them. And there's a beauty in that, because if we were to fully explain God, He stops being God. So there's some things that He says, these belong to the Lord. And one day, the Bible says, we'll know Him face to face. In other words, we'll know everything. Every question will be answered. We're not guaranteed that on this side. But one thing He has revealed is this in Romans 8, 29 through 30. For those that He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Jesus, the Son of God, it says He was the firstborn from the dead. In other words, He would be the first man to rise from the dead but he's also the God man, so he's in his own league. But we would follow after his example. And one day we will rise from the dead. One day our soul will be reunited with a new body and we'll be with God in his presence for all eternity. What that body will look like, I have no idea. And the Bible says we can't imagine what that body will look like. But we'll be with him and that's all that matters. So he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Here's the good news. We get to call God the Father our Father. First member of the Trinity. God the Son, Jesus, we get to call Him Big Brother. Say, that sounds kind of blasphemous. It says He would be the first among many brothers and sisters. Jesus, 
The God-man is our Lord. He is God. He is also our big brother. And the Holy Spirit who ties us all together by His power. 30. And those that He predestined, He also called. Do you remember when God gave the preaching call to you? You see, none of us come to faith just by, oh, they fed me at church. I'm a Christian now. Oh, I got marriage counseling at church. I guess I'm a Christian now. That doesn't make you a Christian. The way you become a Christian is when you hear the gospel preached and it confronts you. And part of you doesn't like it. But the other part of you knows, I need to hear this. Let me ask a question. And because we're not live streaming, it's just us today. How many of you have come to church, you didn't like what I had to say, and you left and you didn't come for a little while? Raise your hand if that's you, be honest. We talked about God knowing and everything. Is there anything that's ever been said from this pulpit? You didn't, you didn't like it, but you agreed with it. You're like, I know that's right, even though I don't like it. Raise your hand if that's you, be honest, okay? That should be mostly all of us. Our nature doesn't like to hear the truth, our sinful nature. I'll be honest, I walked away the same way. Even for my own sermon. Sometimes I hear my own preaching just to make sure I didn't say anything crazy. One time I had to take down the video, cut that part out, apologize to you, which I did the following Sunday, put it back up there because of something I said the wrong way. I shouldn't have said it. It, it was unprofessional. But I hear the sermons. I'm like, ah, I don't like that, but I needed to hear that. That was the call. That's when God told you, you're a sinner. You need me to save you. And many people, the Bible says, are called but few are chosen. Many are invited to come to the wedding supper of the Lamb, but few are chosen to be there. If you love Jesus, give thanks to God. You were chosen. And those that He called, it says, He also justified. By justifying, it means this. The list of things you had, God had against you, the list of sin, the record of wrong, it says it was justified. By Jesus covering it with His blood, it was wiped clean. There's nothing that God has against you. And some of us who are a little bit more reformed, a little bit harder on ourselves than even God would be, we need to repent of that. God has justified us. In God's sight, we are clean, positionally. You're like, well, right now it's because I sin. Repent. But in eternity, God sees you as clean. Live in that new identity. And those that He justified, the Bible says, He also glorified. We're not perfect yet. We will be soon when we either go to be with Him in heaven by dying or when Jesus returns, whichever comes first. We'll be glorified. This little time between you being justified and glorified, between the moment He declared you clean and not guilty and the moment that He perfects you, it's called the process of sanctification. Some of you are going through that. And what is sanctification? It's what it says there, making you into His image, removing from you all the things that don't look like Jesus. I remember I did a play some time ago with um, some of the youth group kids when I was in the youth pastor. And uh, we did that play of the masterpiece. I don't know if you ever saw that skit. And it's, you know, God working on a man. And he has the hammer. He has a little chisel. And he's breaking off pieces of that guy that don't belong to God. Or this doesn't look like my son. Breaks it off. This one, oh, it hurts. Yeah, I need to do this. That's a little illustration for the youth group there. I remember when I did that, I busted my finger. I hadn't swung a hammer in a while. That thing was purple for a few days, and I was like, hey, good job. <laughs> you know, we did a good job. <laughs> but here's the thing, sanctification. You're not perfect. You're not going to be in this life. You will be when you're glorified, when you're with Him. So He has chosen you for eternal life, number three. The hope we can have that He's sovereign is this, that He has given us eternal victory and security. Look at, I love this passage of the Bible, 31 through 34. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all. How will He not also grant Him, or with Him, grant us everything? Here's the wrong way to read that verse. Wow, I must have been really special for God to love me like that. Or, man, I wonder how priceless I am that God had to die for me. It's not about you. You're not that special. You're not that priceless. You're just like the rest of us. You're a sinner. Maybe you just look a little nicer, smell a little nicer, got the makeup that she didn't, got the shoes that he didn't. You might look different, 
We're all the same. The Bible says we are all worthless without Him. But it says there, if God is for us, who could be against us? He did not spare up His own Son, but gave Him up for us. 33. Therefore, who can bring an accusation against God's chosen, God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more, has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes. I love that word. He intercedes for you. That means, I don't know if you remember the book of Job. It's not Job. I remember there was a young guy who's like, Pastor Manny, I want to learn how to get a job. So I opened the book of Job. It's not Job, it's Job. <laughs> He's a young guy. It's okay. The book of Job. We get the curtain pulled back a little bit. And we see what's going on in heaven. We see Job living a righteous life as much as a human can be righteous. And Satan accuses him in front of God. He says he only loves you because you keep blessing him. Job only loves you because you protect him. But if you were to take away the stuff and you were to take away the protection, he wouldn't love you anymore. He would curse you to your face. That's our enemy. We have a real enemy. But here's the good news. He's powerless now because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Nothing can be brought against you in accusation. Even if he were to try, he can't. Jesus paid for it all. And how does that play out for us? We should not be people who accuse one another in Christ. The Bible is so specific that it even says you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't even be bringing lawsuits against one another. As Christians, you shouldn't even go to court against each other. That's how much we're not supposed to accuse each other. How's it going? Are you an accuser? Are you someone who brings up old things, who shows people on their worst day, but you want people to show you on your best day? You see how sometimes we're kind of hypocritical there? It says, who condemns? It's a rhetorical question. No one can condemn you because Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. And he's at the right hand of God interceding for you. We don't need the Virgin Mary to intercede for us. We don't need the saints. We don't need the angels. You don't even need your mom to pray over you. You can pray directly to Jesus. He will listen to you. How's it going? Are you really praying for the things that are going wrong in your life? Or are you just complaining about them? Big difference. When you bring it to God in prayer, you're asking your Father, help me. But when you're complaining, all you're doing is venting to other people. You're not fixing anything. You're making it worse. But it says, who can condemn us? He's at the right hand. And lastly on this, number four, the hope we can have that He's sovereign is this that He has given us eternal love and protection. 35 through 39. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution? When He was writing to these people, they were literally persecuted. They had to be hiding from city to city because the government was after them to arrest them, to kill them for their faith in Jesus. He says, can that separate us from God? Or famine, I remember when this president came in, he said, your Thanksgiving dinner is going to be a lot cheaper this year. Turned out it was doubly expensive than what it was last year. Politicians lie. Wow, really? Didn't know that. Can famine? Have any of you suffered famine? No, none of us have. What is famine? You don't have enough to even get by in the day. Some of us have too much. Have you, ladies, let me ask you this. Have you been on that side of TikTok? Cleaning TikTok? Organizing TikTok? Let me buy these little shelves to put in my fridge because I have so much, I don't know where to put it. <laughs> Amen? Or is my timeline different than yours? I don't know. <laughs> Very different, right? You see, we have so much that we have to organize it and we get pleasure. Oh, this can fit exactly where it needed to. We've never suffered famine. The closest we've ever had was when we had the freeze back in February. Where all your food went bad, right? And you, you had to go get some fast food, and there was no fast food. I remember I went to church's chicken, and they had a big sign, no chicken. <laughs> I was like, so what's the point? <laughs> so what do you do then? Like, oh, we have some bread. Give me the bread. I'll take it. And then in a couple of days, the food was back. Everything was back to normal. But if we were to suffer famine, could that separate us from God's love? Or nakedness? 
or danger or sword? Could World War III separate us from God's love? As it is written, 36, Because of you, God, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. That's what the early Christians suffered. For them, it was a reality. I don't know where I'm going to sleep tonight, what I'm going to eat tomorrow, what clothes I'm going to wear, because i got to leave town, otherwise they're going to kill me. And this was a, a common phrase that was sung among them, was, Lord, for your sake, we're being put to death all day long. We're counted as sheep to be slaughtered. He says, can that separate you? 37, no. And it's a resounding no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him, through Jesus who loved us. Through Him, we're more than conquerors. For I am persuaded, says Paul, that neither death, yours or your family members, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, and the word rulers there is demons, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because He's sovereign, because He's chosen to love you, He won't abandon you. He's with you. And nothing can separate you from God. Not sword, not suffering, not death, nothing, it says, can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And what does that tell us? God the Father loves God the Son so much that now you belonging to Christ, to God the Son, you can't be separated because He'll never abandon His own Son. You're more than a Christian. You're more than a follower of Jesus. You're a son of God if you belong to Him. A daughter of God if you belong to Him. Sons and daughters. So we should trust Him. We should trust His sovereignty. We should trust His decisions even if we don't like them sometimes. Even if it hurts, we should trust Him. And just because He allows it to hurt, because He allows it sometimes, doesn't mean He doesn't love you. He's forging you, refining you, taking away all those things that you trust in, that you shouldn't trust in. My wife and I talked about this. Um, we would like to think of having children soon. And one of our prayers is this, Lord, if you were to take one of our babies away, Help us to love you the same and even more. Help us to trust you. Jesus asked, what do you love more than me? Do you love family? You're not worthy of me. Do you love this? You're not worthy. What do you love more than Jesus? Because God gave you the best that he had. He gave you everything. He gave you his son. Therefore, we should love him above everything. Everything else is second place. God is first. We can trust in his sovereignty, loved ones, because he is good. And because there's no shadow within him, there's no bad intentions from God. He's the only one who has pure intentions all the time. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for speaking to us. We thank you, Lord, for correcting the way that we think. And we thank you, God, for letting us focus on this attribute of yours that is neglected so often. There's nothing that we can do, Lord, to change your will. It's your will. Please help us to change according to your will. And help us, Lord, to not be selfish when we pray for our own gain, our own selfish pleasures. Help us to, like your son Jesus taught us, to pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, if you have suffering for us, waiting to refine us, to test us, help us to endure so that our love for you will continue to grow. And for those who are hurting already, Father, I pray that they would see that all things will work out for the good of those who love you. And that that's a promise we can believe in. Thank you, Lord, for not sparing your son Jesus, but for actually giving him up for us. Now, Lord, as we take of the Lord's Supper, we participate of your table, we do so with a humble heart, remembering your broken body, remembering your blood spilled on that cross for sin, for our sin. And remembering the call that all of us are called to belong to Jesus. I pray, Lord, for your sheep who are here listening, your loved ones, Lord, that if there's anything in their conscience today, in their heart that they need to repent of, that they would do so. If there's any of them living in sin currently, that they would repent, turn away from it, not cling to it, but cling to you instead. 
And if there's any of us, Lord, who are still struggling by temptation, that you would empower us to overcome it. Lord, thank you. We love you. We ask you for your blessing at this time. In Jesus' name, amen.